Welcome back to Conversations. I'm Bill Crystal, and I'm very happy to have with me today my friend Paul Bogala, a uh, prominent political operative uh, thinker about politics, a commentator on television. And I get first met you, I think, when you were a key operative in the Bill Clinton 1992 presidential campaign, and I was going down with a ship on the Bush Quail <laughs> campaign. So yeah, that, that was not your fault, though. That was, oh, thank you. That was, that was that good to you. That was, that was, you said the right thing there. That was appreciative. <laughs> Well, let's begin with that. I mean, that was exciting to be part of a winning presidential campaign. How did you get involved? How does it all happen? I mean, people afterwards, people become well known and they think, oh, you were there forever and you and Carvo and Clinton. But that's it's kind of like anything, though. It's a, a lot of it's just word of mouth and it's luck. And, and, and actually, one of my beliefs in life and I, I teach at Georgetown, I tell my students this careers are mostly about attitude and timing. Okay? <laughs> you have to throw an attitude, right? You have to be willing uh, to move to Kentucky or New Jersey or Georgia or Pennsylvania or all these places I moved to to work for very little money. That was the attitude. But then if you're lucky, the timing comes around. And sometimes the timing's wrong. For me, the timing was perfect. My partner and I, James Carville, had done a, uh, run a campaign for Zell Miller, and he won. He was elected governor of Georgia. And that was in 19... 1990. Zell was very close friends with Bill Clinton. I'd never met him. I didn't know the guy from Adam. He You'd didn't been know in me. politics for how long at that point? Just? I had been, I graduated college in 83. Oh, so this is nice. Right. So seven years. I was still kind of on the front of my career. Some, and you'd... I had I'd worked on the Hill a little bit and had done campaigns all around the country. And in between was getting a law degree. Well. But Zell was pals with Clinton. So we had helped elect him. And then we left. You know, we didn't want to work in state government in Atlanta. I was not qualified. And mm-hmm. So we were off doing the next thing. And Governor Clinton was going around the country seeing his friends and saying, this is 1991. You know, I'm thinking about running. I'm going to run, laying, laying the groundwork, as these guys do. He spent the night in the governor's mansion in, our, in Atlanta <coughs> with Zell. And they, they stayed up all night plotting and planning. And, and Miller told me the story. He said that, he said, you know, I'll endorse you, which, you know, w- w- will help, but I'll move my primary up. Because they are both southern governors. They wanted the South to have a larger voice in the Democratic Party. So I'll move the primary up. So you'll have a beachhead in case you don't work out in Iowa and New Hampshire. And as kind of an aside, he said, you got to talk to these boys that ran my campaign, James Carville and Paul McGowan. And Clint said, I never heard of them. And Zell exactly. said, to his credit, maybe that's the problem. Maybe that's the good thing is that, you know, we should get some new blood. Back then, you know, now I'm an old war horse. Back then, we were new blood. And just on Zell's recommendation, Clinton called us. and We went and met with him and just love at first sight. You is know, that right? Remarkable. So, so many of the winning campaigns I'm struck by this are people who have come off successful statewide campaigns, but are not have not are not on their fourth presidential campaign. Right. In fact, I'd say most of the cases we can think of in both parties where people did their third and fourth campaigns, it was sort of applying ten years or twenty year old recipes. You know, there's something about being fresh, isn't there? Absolutely, that's the problem. People say, people like me, I've got thirty years experience in politics. Well, you know, I've got like two repeated fifteen times. You know, it's yeah. a real risk. I think the far better course is, I mean, it's what I did, I guess I think it's, is to go out in America, you know, work in places particularly that are either swing states or really tough for your folks. Right. You know, Kentucky is a very purple state, probably more red than blue. I loved working there. I learned a lot. Georgia, the same way. Other people, they want to come to Washington. And, and you know, I, I'm all for it. I love it here. But, you know, they want to start, they, they intern at the Democratic Party, the Republican Party, they work their way up to one of the committees and the, this right. committee and that. I just don't think that's the better way. I think it's it, what you learn is how impossibly vast and diverse this country is. And it's really good to have that in your mind when you're sitting in an office building in Washington, D.C. that, well, actually, there's somebody in Paducah, Kentucky, who's going to take this a very different way. Let's think about her. Yeah. So Bill Clinton meets, what flies you guys fly out to Little Rock to meet him or you meet him No, somewhere? he happened to be in D.C. And, and, when we were at the same time. So we, we went and had a glass of iced tea and sat it's the only time in my life I think I ever had, seriously, um, love at first sight with a politician because this is so ingenious. He did not treat us like strategists. He did not talk strategy with us. He didn't say, you know, my wife's from Illinois. That's kind of an early primary. We can do well there. And right. Miller's going to move the southern primary up. And I, he, I still remember it. I could tell you where we're sitting. Yeah, so where was this? We were sitting. It's, it was, uh, it's, I don't know, they keep changing the names of these hotels. It was a hotel on New Jersey Avenue. And it was then, I think, called like the Powers Court Yeah, that one's changed about like 20 that. times. Yeah, yeah, right. I know. On Capitol The now. Washington Court Hotel, I think it's yes. called now. Kind of a right dumpy, not, not, the, not the classiest yeah, hotel was, uh, in Washington. We were, you know, we were <laughs> right. not very well off. And we <laughs> met him there. And, and I remember, to this day, he talked about his daughter, who then was about 12, maybe 11, talked about how in the far-off future, we'd have the turn of the century, 
what kind of a world would she inherit? And he talked to us like, like as if we were citizens, actually, who loved right. our country. And let me tell you, that's a great strategy. If you want a really good strategist, actually treat them like a patriot and a citizen, which no one had ever done before, you know? Right. We probably would have signed on just because of his talent anyway as hacks. But boy, it's, we fell in love because that's all he wanted to talk about was his set of ideas. And I remember we walked out of there and Carvel said, my only concern is this guy too good to be true. Is that right? And we actually later heard that in focus groups with lots of voters too, because he was so just impressive at first sight. It's hard to remember back to those days, but, but the guy was clearly the class of the field even then. And had this new Democrat message, which was different from the Democrats of 84 and 88, presumably. The it was really Ron important Dale, to me. Dukakis Democrats. I had worked for Zell Miller, who's, of course, a very conservative Democrat. I worked for Bob Casey, uh, who was the governor of Pennsylvania. His son is now a senator from Pennsylvania. Um, I had uh, worked for a number of more moderate conservative Democrats. Dick Gephardt, who was then, you know, pretty moderate Democratic leader. And... What, one of the things I loved about Clinton is he was very much part of the movement to remake the Democratic Party. Right. We used to go to these conferences, and Democrats would sit there, and they would, they would, first off, they'd blame the voters. Well, they're just too stupid. You know, the Democratic conceit is always, we're so much smarter than everyone, which mm -hmm. is nuts. But, so they would attack the voters, because the voters were stupid. How could they vote for Reagan? Well, you know, 49 states did, and there's only <laughs> 50 of them, so guy had something on the ball. And then the second thing they would do is attack you guys. Oh, the Republicans are too mean. Like, like you're supposed to throw the game? Right. Okay, and then finally Clinton came along with Miller, Benson, Gore, a lot of really influential Democrats, Sam Nunn, and they said, actually, the problem's us. We've gotten out of step. Here's where I saw it. I was working for Dick Gephardt in his presidential campaign in 1988. Went out to Iowa. And I love Iowa, and I love the caucuses, but they do tend to bring the most committed people out. And there was a group back then called Star Pack, which was a very, very liberal, really a disarmament group, not even just anti-war. And I was working for Gephardt, but Al Gore got up there and someone challenged him in the audience. And they said, you voted for the flight testing of ballistic missiles. And Gore said, well, of course I did. We, we have to have them. I mean, we're a superpower. We have to have missiles. And so of course, we have to test them. We have to make sure they work. God forbid we need them. We don't want our, our soldiers with missiles that don't. And they booed him off the stage. Wow. And I thought, there's something really wrong with my party. I mean, I, I'm all for peace, okay? But when you can't even vote to test missiles, it, he, they boot him off the stage. And I thought, boy, there's something. And, and Clinton really spoke to that, the need to bring the party back to the center. And it was really, as a political legacy, a really important part of what he did. So in 91, you, how does it work? You went down at some point to Little Rock? You have to be willing to pick up and move places when you're... Uh... Yes, well, we cut a deal. Clinton obviously wanted to base the campaign in Little Rock, which was genius. Mostly because his daughter was there, but also he didn't want to be trapped in the New York-Washington um, uh, establishment. And he was governor, right? So he had and he to... was the governor. He had to run the state. Yeah, right. And, and so it made perfect sense. We were about to have a baby, and so my wife did not want to give birth in Little Rock. She wanted to give birth with where her doc was here in, in Northern Virginia. So I got on the plane. Carvel, Stephanopoulos, the whole campaign moved to Little Rock. You had to live in Little Rock. And I was one of the rare exceptions because I, I traveled with the candidate. And that's kind of how we divided it up. Yeah. Carvel ran the war room. I was the, the body guy on the plane working with uh, the governor to keep him on message. And I had the way better deal. I know they made a movie about the war room and Carvel and Stephanopoulos got rich and famous. I highly recommend, if you ever get a chance to spend a year of your life sitting next to Bill Clinton on an airplane and traveling a million miles to 48 states, I highly recommend it. And so you it's start the most off, amazing guy you don't have your own mind. plane to start with, right? Just we we would we would start out on like Delta Airlines yeah. carrying our own bags. Yeah, right. and, right. and uh, then, you know, these things snowball, and it, it really goes very quickly. Uh, and when did you think, were there moments you thought you weren't going to make it? When did you think you were going to make it? Did you think you were sort of the favorite from the beginning? I, I sort of... I can't remember. Clinton launched in the fall. It was later in those days, right? So Much he, later. He waited till October of yeah. 1991. Right. Remarkably late. Uh, but that's because President Bush was so popular. You that's know, right. he had prosecuted a war successfully. It was the first time since Vietnam. And so it was, it, I mean, young people don't remember. You were in the White House then. We had parades. And right. I, I remember when the war ended, I was working on the Hill for the Democratic majority leader. And the president was going to come and give a speech about how we, we won the war. And my cousin fought in that war. I mean, I really, like most Americans, was really deeply proud of our country. And the only argument we were having is, 
well, we have bigger flags to wave. Literally, the Democrats exactly. like we're looking yeah. for flags to wave on the floor where the Republicans wave flags that were bigger. Right. Uh, in that sense, it was a great time. But as a partisan matter. And Gephardt and Gore, who had run in 88 and done adequately well when they lost to Dukakis, didn't run in 92, I guess partly because. Because of Bush. They were too intimidated they thought by Bush. Bush. Was, yeah. uh, and even Lloyd Benson, who was, you know, God rest his soul, a real powerhouse in, in my party. And, and you're right, uh, Gore and Dick Gephardt and Jay Rockefeller, who really could have, I think, made quite a good run. They all stood down. And the thought in 91 was, well, somebody's going to be a sacrificial lamb. In the end, Clinton's gift was to be able to see around corners. Yeah. And you can go back to that announcement speech, which I had nothing to do with. He actually announced before Carvel and I joined. Hmm. So I don't say this with pride of authorship. Go back to that announcement speech, and you see the whole animating vision of his presidency. Um, more domestic than, than foreign, more, more a little more populist, kind of middle-class-based economics, but also a deep skepticism of too much bureaucracy, too much deficit. I mean, it was really exactly what what he believed in, which is kind of nice to look back. It wasn't just a stunt. It was his actual vision. And he was associated with that New Democrat message. I mean, that was pretty, po- he had done that as governor and head of that Democratic Leadership Council. And It was really a big part of him. I, I, we went back during the campaign all the way to 74, his first run for office outside of student government, I guess. Mm-hmm. Uh, he ran for the House against John Paul Hammerschmidt and lost. Right. But we found, and again, you had a populist thing where he was attacking oil companies, but you also had a thing where he, a message there where he was worried and skeptical of bureaucracy. It was, so the guy has had, you know, they, everybody ticks and tacks and zigs and zags over their career. But for a remarkably long period of time, he's had pretty much the same basic approach to things. And that's something I admire. You, obviously, you see the same thing in Reagan. Okay, Reagan started life as an FDR liberal, but once he entered public life, you can go back to his the speech in 1964, all the way to his final speech as president, and there's a real consistency. Yes, he raised taxes here, or zigged and zagged there, but in the right. main, he was the same guy. Right. I remember vividly being in the White House, and um, I'll tell this very brief story, and then you'll tell me what it looked like from your from the Clinton campaign side. And it was a December, middle of December, and Mario Cuomo, will he get in? That was the huge story. And he was a major figure, obviously, after the 84 convention speech. And at that point, what, a three-term governor? Yeah. yeah. Beginning his third term as governor of New York. And um, I remember he didn't, you know, the plane famously didn't take off from Albany to New Hampshire on filing right. deadline day, December 15th, something like that. And I remember there was a little meeting in the White House that evening and great exhilaration. Uh, it's Sam Skinner, the chief of staff's office. Yeah. Well, Cuomo's out. Now it's really going to be fine because we have a bunch of nobodies trying to guess us. And I will say to my credit, I said, I don't know. You know, in a way, I think Cuomo would have been be- easier to beat because he's a New York liberal, familiar type, Dukakis. And I'm a little worried about Clinton, that new Democrat stuff. He's a very clever politician. Oh, no, Bill. Come. We've been around, This was classic. We've been in three or four of these presidential campaigns. There's right. no way they're going to let Clinton over President Bush, who won the war and all this. Now, from your point of view, Cuomo, were you guys very worried about that? Or was that a- Enormously. But, you know, but it's like before a fight. We were, oh, well, we're going to beat him. We're going to, you know. But he, everybody can look at the tapes. Enormously talented orator and thinker. Clinton had enormous respect. You know, Clinton's, I think, a very bright guy, too. So he really admired the combination that Cuomo brought of heart and head. When he didn't run, there was this huge exhale. But I will say, here's the analog in our campaign. The guy Carvel worried about the most was Doug Wilder. Is that right? The only one in a race, who, in the potential race, right, who, who had the kind of same base among Southern African Americans that Clinton and had. And Doug Wilder was the governor? Governor of Virginia, Virginia. first African American governor in Virginia history. He had been elected in 1989. Uh, Virginia then, a very Republican state. Right. So not only a Democrat, but an African American Democrat. But sort of a moderate. African and moderate, Democrat, and just what a gifted politician. And, and Carver was the one who always kept saying, we were scared to death of Cuomo, okay? But he said, we can't win if Wilder gets in the race. Oh. Because that was really our base, was trying to put together a black-white coalition. But our base began with African-American voters who were concentrated in the South and the Democratic Party. And w- if Wilder had gotten in the race, with his talent, with the platform of a, being governor of, frankly, a much bigger state, <laughs> much closer to the media center as well, uh, Wilder was really intimidating, too, and that was something we didn't talk to the press a lot about, but those were the two moments, I think, when it became apparent to us at least we had a, a clear path to the nomination. And what there were, there were some bumps on the path, and famously, in the Clinton 92 campaign. I don't know, what was it like? Anything, any particularly memorable moments? You were, so you were with pretty much with 
Go- it was mostly Governor Clinton with Governor Clinton. And, you on know, the these road. these ups and downs and, like, lounge singer came out and said she'd had an affair with him. And uh, it was a, it was, it would taught me a lot. Um, one of the things it taught me is something Clinton said then. If we make it about their life, not mine, we'll both be better off. Don't allow yourself to become focused on yourself. You know, like I love country music. And these new artists come out and they write about truth and beauty and love and mama and whatever. Well, by the third album, they're writing about life on the road and how hard it is to bounce around in a $200,000 bus. And like, you know, dude, that's actually not something I can relate to. Politicians get that way. They get in a campaign and the only questions they're asked about are about themselves. And they start only thinking about themselves. And what, what, what that taught me is Clinton decided to make it about you, not me, as he always said. And because he came into the race steeped in a bunch of ideas, he didn't have to create stuff on the fly. There was kind of a staying power to his ideas. And that's what he clung to. That was our life raft. And that's what got us through it. And, and then we would start to hear voters say that. It was like, okay, you know, he's had his problems. But it, it, a lot of people blame the media. They did, and, and, and I think fairly. But they also said he's kind of a young guy with a head full of good ideas, actually cares about me. You know, let's take a chance. People, he's such a charismatic guy, Clinton, and such a good candidate. People forget what a, I think, I was struck by this on the other side, what a policy-heavy campaign it was. And I don't think politicians subsequently have quite picked up on that, which just fits with caring. It's not just that you care about people, but you actually have a very concrete set of proposals it's so to important. help them. And you cannot think from the moment you announce it's election night. There's just no time to like really think through, how do I want to restructure Social Security? You just can't. Right. So he had already thought all that stuff through before he began. I think that's really important. We always viewed him as, you know, this great block of marble that we would have to chip stuff away from rather than an empty vessel into which we would pour content. He always had too much content. I used to tease him about that. Like you have a solution, you have three solutions for every problem. Right. It was so bad. This is how, he guy is just smart. We were doing a town hall meeting in New Hampshire. He's the governor of Arkansas. We had no business being up there. And, you know, they talk funny and it's freezing cold. And he loved it. And he kept saying, you know, Arkansas is just like New Hampshire and here's why. And there's some woman got in a town hall meeting and she said, as I recall, memory is an unreliable thing. But she said, why did they stop the passenger train line from Portsmouth to Manchester? And the answer is, who cares, lady? <laughs> right. I'm running for president. He knew. <laughs> he actually knew, and he started explaining, well, when the Staggers Rail Act passed, and he was just going through. I, I remember, I actually went up to him and I was like, can you just pretend once in a while you don't know something, just like so we can relate to you? <laughs> that, that, that you can't coach. That does not come from a political consultant. Right. You know, and you do see this with some of these folks, that that can sustain you, too, when you get in trouble, and that's a, that's a wonderful thing. Did he take advice easily or resist it like a lot of these guys do? or He... You know, it's interesting. He, Clinton actually didn't like yes men. He wanted to win people over. That's why he always tried to, you know, like Reagan Democrats tried to get Clinton right. Republicans. So if you were too much, oh, you're so great, you're so great, you know, he'd stop listening to you. Hmm, that's interesting. Um, he would want advice. He'd very often, more in the White House than in the campaign, he would take the devil's advocate. You know, he'd really want, because I think he was very worried about the, the, the kind of yes person, yes man syndrome. But he did. He in. You know, my job was so easy because all we would do, the people on the plane, and we had good people on the plane. It wasn't just me. We had Dee Myers. We had Bruce Reed. We had Rodney Slater. We had a really talented team on the plane. And um, we would just write like a paragraph a day, not a speech. He would have his stump speech, but he could interlineate so well and modify for different regions so well that all we had to do is like, here's the hit we want today. You know, here's the soundbite, frankly, right. and deliver this on unemployment or whatever the, the issue was that day. And he could do all the rest. So we were kind of spoiled that way. So you won the nomination after Cuomo didn't run and Wilder, and you had a few challenges, but none of them was quite up to it ultimately, I guess, right? I mean, I, I think they, they just, none of the rest of them were able to put it together in the same way. Right. But, you know, Tom Harkin, Bob Carey, who were in the Medal of Honor, uh, those were the two people actually Carvel and I interviewed with as well to work for. That was that right? Very impressive guys. And, and uh, you know, Carvel's a Marine. He really loved Senator Kerry, Bob Kerry, because of his war record and, and just as a remarkable guy. Uh, 
and then it actually turned out, I guess the, the ones who nagged us the most were the ones that we didn't begin to think, I didn't begin thinking would be the most Songus. Paul Songus and Jerry Brown. Jerry Brown, I know. He's like, um, <laughs> but you're right, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't the strongest field the Democrats ever produced. And I think it's because Bush. the president was so intimidating. Yeah. Isn't that an irony? And then he ended up getting the lowest re-elective president in, uh, since Hoover, I guess. Uh, yeah, right? yeah, amazing. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good lesson it's about politics. It's a fickle politics. business. It is. People who look at mid a year and a half out and think they have some sense of what the country's mood is going to be or where people are going to, you know, well, it's crazy. Th this, I think, is something pundits should learn. It's why I like, I, seriously, I like listening to you. Most of these people here in Washington, they think tomorrow will be just like today, only more so. Okay, so now we're sitting down, and it's February, and it's bitter cold. So obviously by July, it'll be like 20 below. Yeah, right. Yeah. No, actually. Yeah. <laughs> tomorrow will not be, the one lesson in life is tomorrow will not be like today. Now, it's guesswork as to which way it will be different. Right. And that's kind of the art of this thing. But these people who always think, oh, well, you know, you're up by 10, this, but they're by, you know, next week you'll be up by 20, and then right. you have 400% of the vote by the election. You know? <laughs> right. Did you guys always think you had a pretty good, once you were in 92, though, and Bush had taken the hits of the Buchanan challenge and the recession and looking out of touch and all that, and then Perot, I guess. Did you guys think you had a good chance, pretty good chance, sort of? We, we thought we had a pretty good chance because Clinton could contest states that Dukakis had not. And I think it really did help a lot that he was a Southerner. Um, it helped enormously. And so he obviously was going to carry his home state. You know, and then we, it, Everything changed around the convention. That that was only about a 10-day period. Yeah, I remember. But uh, Ross Perot got out of the race in the middle of the Democratic convention. And was that coordinated? We always wanted to no, was that? No. Really? Oh. Did, How did you hear about it? You just heard about from it. From the news. Say, Somebody is that called right? Stephanopoulos. Some news person said hey, Perot's having a press conference in five minutes. <laughs> we're like, quick, turn on the television. And that was literally like the first day of the convention? Yes. Like and he yeah. said, he actually said, as if we'd script it. I could see why you think. He said, the Democratic Party has its act together. They couldn't have given us a better message. Right. Because we were the hapless Democrats. We'd lost something like five out of the last six presidential elections. Right. And so he got out of the race. Gore joined the ticket. Were you involved in that? A bit. So <laughs> tell us about that. If that's, is that any... I was not for Gore. Uh, I don't think he knows that, so hopefully he won't watch this tape. <sighs> we'll, we'll send well, it to him. I was, I was for Harris Wofford. The most important qualification is he was a client of mine. Right. But, but you had helped elect him. I'd helped elect him senator, senator in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. In a big upset. His big upset. In November he beat Dick Thornburg. Ninety-one in a special election. Right, but also from my, I think, wrong but very conventional analysis. Clinton was young. Harris was older. Clinton was a Baptist. Wofford was a Catholic. Clinton was a Southerner. Wofford was a Northeasterner. Clinton was a New Democrat moderate. Wofford had worked for both Dr. King and President Kennedy from the liberal wing of the party. Right. So it just matched up perfectly. Like, right. Plus he was a And he was an impressive guy. A great Wofford, a president right? of two colleges. Yeah, and, you know, sort of older statesman type. Yes, and really yeah. brought a, a, yeah. a gravitas. Um, and, you know, Clinton interviewed him and loved him, thought he was great. As soon as he interviewed Gore, he said that. He said, that's, uh, that's him. It was, it was amazing. And hmm. I stupidly said, he hasn't even endorsed you. But he hadn't. Gore wanted nothing to do with our campaign in the primaries. And Clinton said, you know, I think if I pick him for the ticket, he will. <laughs> yeah, I said, it. okay, good point. I said, well, what does he bring? He's the same religion. He's the same region. He's the same age. He's the same philosophy. And he said, I might die. And I thought, oh, my God. I, you know, that's a dip. That's when you start. It is the first presidential decision these people make. Right. And, you know, I was never a fan of, of George W. Bush. But I don't doubt at all that he picked Cheney for the right reasons. I don't think he was the right man. But he picked him for the right reasons. I don't think he needed Wyoming's electoral votes right, or right. Cheney's charisma. He thought... God forbid if something happened, I need someone could step in on day one. And right. that, that is, I think, a really telling thing about presidential characters. The first time these people have to make a decision with that kind of weight and consequence. And so I was really proud of Clinton, actually, that he overruled me. He rolled right over me. He did, you know. Didn't, didn't this take a long time to ponder no, your it's advice. interesting. It's just as soon as he uh, met Gore. It was, it was that turned out to work politically, too. But the two young guys, the bus tour, I remember this well, of course. Right. It was um, the, the sum, the whole was greater than the sum of the parts because, yeah. it, and we had this nagging problem that Carvel identified the first time we met Clinton. Is he too good to be true? Does he really believe, is he too slick? Well, when you pick a guy who's just the same, it actually tells people, hey, this really matters to me. Because hmm. if, 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 God forbid, something happens to me, you're going to get a carbon copy. That's how deeply I believe in these ideas. It's not just like a, 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 a trick for, to get your vote. And I had not thought of that. Um, 
but I think that was part of it too. Is it, it gave Clinton a sense of authenticity, not just popularity. Any moments in the general election campaign where you thought, oh my God, this might be going south or the, the broke up? The primary campaign was so right. awful. But in the general, it went better. Perot got back in. Right. But and was in the debates. It was in the debates. Clinton sealed the deal. Yeah. I, it was. I remember, again, if memory serves, it was uh, Mickey Cantor negotiating with James Baker. And I love Mickey, but... And he's negotiating many great trade, but James Baker's like the greatest right. negotiator, diplomat of my time. And somehow, the Bush campaign agreed to debates. And Clinton had done thousands of debates and town hall meetings. It's all he'd been doing. He didn't have a country to run. He had a, he had a state, but there are fewer people in his state than the city of Houston. So like he could kind of manage the state pretty easily. And the president had all this stuff going on. Plus, he hated debates. You couldn't have not. Do you think you could have not agreed to debates at that point? After that? I guess there'd have been debates in eighty since seventy six. Right. Ford, Ford and Carter began right. the the, after, tra the modern tradition right, after, right, Kennedy. after Kennedy. I guess not. It's an interesting question, though, whether he could have but or the, maybe limited it to one or something. He agreed to three, and and then he agreed to the thing we wanted most, which was astonishing, which was a town hall format. It was great. Yeah. But Clinton was so empathetic, and the presidency does isolate you, you know, and. I, I, I remember getting the word. My memory is we were in Wisconsin, we were campaigning. And Mickey called and said, we have three debates and one's going to be a town hall. And I said, are you kidding me? Because we knew. And there was that famous moment of the woman in, in, in the debate in Richmond. Which was the town hall one. It's a town hall debate. Second debate, I think. Yeah. And, and I believe the woman's name is Marissa. And she said, how does the national debt affect you? Which is kind of an inchoate question, actually. Yeah, it's, it's, you know, what does that mean? The national debt? And so President Bush gave kind of an answer like that. He's like, I, I don't really get what you're saying. And he, I think he used a phrase like that. I don't really get it, or I, I don't see what you mean. And, and, and he said, just because a person has means doesn't mean that they don't care. And you know, he was just floundering around, in part because the question was not framed by a professional questioner, a journalist. And it was like not a fair fight. Clinton sprang out of his chair, walked over to her. Before he answered, he asked her a bunch of questions. Do you know people who've been laid off? If you got friends, well, I, I run this small state. And when a factory closes, there's a very good chance I know the people who lost their job. And it really has an impact on me. Here's the impact I had. It was just sort of in our little holding room, we were like throwing the towel. This is just, you know. I remember that so well because um, I think that was, I can't remember anywhere what the sequence was, but was that after the vice presidential debate? Because I, uh, my, I little, my bit piece in history was negotiating the vice presidential debate with, who did it? With uh, Jack Quinn, I guess. Mm -hmm. was running Gore's kind of side of the campaign. And we had a very quick, we didn't, ours was actually very loosely structured, which was good for Quayle, and we did okay, I thought. You know, he just, right. he just carried Gore's book out there, and we tried to carry Gore's book out, which was against the rules, but it kind of like, <laughs> and they just quoted from Gore's book where he attacked the automobile or whatever, you know, what was, the, what was this? The book? internal Earth in the balance, engine. earth in the Earth balance. in the balance. Yeah. Internal combustion engine is one of the terrible things that's happened for mankind. We figured that probably wasn't going to play too well in <laughs> Michigan. <Detroit. laughs> yeah. Yeah. So we did our best. But if I, again, I may have my memory a little confused, but I think there was, we went after the first presidential debate and did okay, and it looked like there was sort of an outside shot, and I think the town hall was then the next debate. I think that's right. It was the, it and was the second it, debate. And I, and I watched with, with Vice President Quell, who was a smart, uh, was underrated in many ways by the right. media, but one thing, he was a very shrewd political, you know, uh, analyst, and, uh, and he just, I remember, he was so loyal to President Bush, he wasn't going to say anything, but I remember just him shaking his head as he watched Clinton do that. Was that the same debate that Bush looked at his watch? Yes. Right. Which was innocent in a way, right? He just was thought, like, can't. you can't. Yeah, I know. I but, know. <laughs> you know, and then to his eternal credit, there's no more gracious man God ever made than George H.W. Bush. And when they dedicated the Clinton Library, it was bitter cold, freezing rain. Now, his son had just been reelected, so he's in a good mood. But this is 2004, and President Bush Sr. stood up there and spoke, and he told that story. He said, you know why I looked at my watch? I kept thinking, how, when, how long do I have to be debating this guy? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> he was good. so gracious. Yeah, that's fantastic. But, you know, it, you have to, this is a lesson I took from this as a strategist, you have to work with what you have and who you have. You can't pretend. If your guy doesn't like debates, or your woman, you, you can't force her into it. You can't force them into it. Either take the hit for not doing them, or manage it so carefully um, that you know, it becomes almost like a joint press conference. Put three or four journalists up there, right. long answers. You know, there, there's, there would have been ways to mitigate that. But if, if you get, let Bill Clinton get a chance to directly interact with voters in front of 50 million people, you're not going to win. 
Yeah, and you and, and and Bush didn't win, and Bill Clinton did. So that was that was congratulations on well, that. Well, again, it was not me. This is, I always tell people that sports reporters are so much smarter than political reporters, because sports reporters say Secretariat won the race. <laughs> Right. They don't say Ron Turcott. I've actually memorized the name of the guy who was the jockey because no sports reporter said Ron Turcott wins the Triple Crown, right? Right. They understand. And in these things, as you know, you rise and fall with your candidate. Totally. You do. Now, sometimes there's larger forces that even the best candidate can't overcome. John McCain was never going to win no matter what. It had right. nothing to do with Senator McCain. It right. was the country was sick of Bush. We were in a terrible crisis of, of the economic collapse. So that was not one. But Usually, if you win, it's not because of the strategist. Yeah. You know, and, and the, the president had, again, James Baker is nobody I admire more. He had had Lee Atwater and Lee passed, and that was a terrible loss. I agree with that. Um, yeah. But he had quite a good, he married Madeline. Yeah. You know, he, no, had he had quite a good, a good the team. team wasn't the problem. Right. right. It was just 12 just, years and the recession and said, and I think Clinton really saw, I would say I was in that Bush White House. I do think President Bush thought till near the end that he would win, and that was because in the America he had lived in, mm -hmm. Being a competent commander in chief, which he was, winning the war, ending the Cold War successfully, and building on what Reagan had done, that would get you reelected. Right. I and mean, that was sort of the test of a president. And Clinton did see that we were in a post Cold War moment right. and that you we could, needed to talk, not just could talk, but you needed to talk about education and health care and the like. He did also make sure that he covered himself enough on foreign policy that he didn't look, you know, I mean, A, he knew a lot and he chose Gore, who was a senator and a foreign policy kind of expert type and senator. And from sort of the hawkish wing of his party. Right. So he sort of covered himself on that. But he saw that you could have a domestic policy election, uh, which you really right. couldn't have quite in the Cold War years, That's I think. exactly right. He, he chose not to run in 1988, which yeah. was, we didn't know it then, but it was coming to the end of the Cold War. Yes. But I don't think he could have had the same success in 1988, frankly. He might have won, he might not have. But the moment and the man came together. The, the collapse of the, the Soviet Union and the fact that President Bush handled it so masterfully yeah, I know. It's with irony. Baker and Scowcroft, ironically. But, of course, the Brits fired Churchill as soon as the Second World War was over. And internally, we didn't say this in public a lot. We tried not to because it's disrespectful. We, we would talk about him as yesterday's man and having a gold watch strategy. Right, that, that He's of the past and, and a heroic past, and good for him. Let's give him a gold watch. But now we have to fix health care and, and create jobs, and that's for a different generation, a different mindset. And I, I think that was, that's how we approached it strategically. And it could not have uh, been possible without the, the collapse of the Soviet Union. So you won in 92, and uh, did you go, I can't remember, did you go right into the White House in January of 93? No, with President Clinton? we had a new baby. We had oh. a, our firstborn came right in the middle of the campaign. And so I, I barely knew him. I'd, I'd barely seen him in the first three, four months of his life. And so I very much wanted to be a dad. And uh, so I was a consultant to the Democratic Party advising the president, you know, but, but not a White House official, not I a see. government employee. I was paid by the party. And that was a, uh, that was a great deal because that was – Access and influence without accountability. <laughs> right. Right. I mean, I've done both. You've done both. When you're actually working in the government, there is real accountability. Right. And, you know, when you're a political advisor, of course, the ultimate accountability was we lost the House and the Senate. And I, I, I wound up moving to Texas then. Is you that? Know, we, I forgot we that. We lost is the that? biggest landslide in history, and I was one of the president's chief political advisors. I had to be responsible for that. And, um, and we kept having more kids. We wanted to live in Austin, where we're from. And I taught at the university, and I thought I was done. That we we're going to have kids, and I was going to. I was doing like some corporate PR, which was really interesting and fun. I had clients like Southwest Airlines and Coca-Cola and the San Antonio Spurs, and really just thought I had the life I wanted. But I, I was asked to come back and help prepare for the debates in 1996, and of course was spending more time with them then. And and during the <coughs> debate preps, Vernon Jordan, the president's best friend pull me aside and said, you know, I, I think we're going to win. I said, I think you will. And he said, and, and George is going to leave, George Stephanopoulos. And he said, and the president wants you to come back and take that role. And I'd say my initial response was a vulgarity. I said, no way. And um, Vernon was, you know, a little shocked. And I went home and told my wife, and she said, are you crazy? Of course we're going to go. She was so was game. Right? She was like seven months pregnant again. Oh, wow. And, you know, you have a chance to serve your president. It was crazy for me to like say no. And Vernon, fortunately, did not take no for an answer. And so I wound up in the second term as a White House official, which was infinitely more difficult, but also more rewarding. 
So tell us about that. What, what you were in the, just the mechanics of it. You were just to the I president. I was counselor to the president. Well, that's nice. So you didn't have too much in the way of line responsibilities. Right. It's the greatest job, and that's kind of how he talked me into it, um, because he said, because I, I said, which is true. I said this team he was he had assembled for the second term. So this is a much better team. You know, often you run out of gas in these things. This was a much better team, much more organized. He himself was much more disciplined and organized than when he started. And I said that. I said, you don't need me. This is a much better team than you started with. And he said, yes, but they're all strangers to me. Hmm. And he wanted not only the familiarity, frankly, he wanted somebody who would say, you're full of beans. And I had to really adjust, though, because in that campaign, honestly, nothing ever leaked. Democrats had lost so many times, they just really hung together. It, it was the tightest. We had strategic unanimity. We had real cohesion. And so nothing ever leaked. We were very open, and the war room was famously open. You could leave the pole laying around, and hundreds of people were in and out. Go work in the White House. Everything you say leaks, especially if you're, like, criticizing the president. So you, you have to learn. You wait till every, you, know, you have, like, the debate or the discussion, and then everybody leaves, and you kind of pull them aside and go, you know, that's a terrible idea. You can't do that. Or, or whatever. Um, so I loved it. I, I got to work. And you were there for things. most of the second term? For I was there for 97 and 98 and a, that the third, first third or fourth quarter of, uh, of 99. So about, about two years. Yeah. And loved it. I mean, it happened to coincide with the impeachment of the President of the United States. That was good, yeah. Uh, I mean, we, we lived through a lot of amazing stuff. There, there was one week in December of 1998. Here's what happened. Um, Yeltsin had gone missing. You know, so the Union was now free. It was Russia. They had a freely elected guy who we had a great relationship with, and he'd gone missing. Um, on top of that, there was some blow up in the Middle East, and the president had to go personally to Israel and try to negotiate uh, some kind of peace in the Middle East. I can't remember what it was. Um, and then the, uh, the, the, the Speaker of the House had decided he was going to step down. The <laughs> Speaker designate resigned, and then they impeached the President of the United States. Right. On top of all that, Lawton Childs, the governor of Florida, passed away, and he was a very close friend of Clinton's. Uh, had just been succeeded by Jeb Bush, but he, Clinton was recruiting him to actually come work for him. He was going to be uh, an ambassador to the Americas, a job that Mac McClarty had started. So we had five or six major things, including the impeachment of the President of the United States, all happen in that same week. And, um, you know, that's, that's a little much. In the middle of all that, then, one of my children was 18 months old, and he got a rotavirus, which is, you know, they lose all their fluids. And in the third world, you die. In America, you live fine. You know, you spend a night in a hospital hooked up to IVs. And so uh, my wife called and said, you know, the baby's really bad. I'm going to take him to the hospital. I met her there. She went home to take care of the other kids. And I spent the night with this infant in my arms hooked up to the ankle and the wrist with an IV and they saved his life easily. I mean, it's not a problem if you're in America, if you're in a wealthy country. They rehydrated him, and I went in my same clothes back to work at 6 or 7 in the morning when she came to relieve me. And I remember I was sitting in a meeting. It was in a cabinet room. And, but I, was, I looked like what I was. You know, it was all this going on, and then a really worried, bedraggled uh, dad. And this friend of mine said, this is, this is really getting to you, isn't it? Oh, that's Meaning right. the impeachment. I was like, actually, it's the worst of my worries. Well, at least, least of my worries. Yeah, right. right. So what else, tell us about the White House. I mean, how is it different from outsiders think or even than you had thought since you had been close to a campaign and you had advised the president. But it is different being on the White House staff. It's completely right? different. It's completely different. The, you know, you do feel and you should the sense of responsibility. You know, in a campaign, everything you do is simply what you say. It's just a communications tool. The White House communications is vital, but you actually have to do stuff too. Yeah, right. And so the follow through... And the, even for a Democrat, and I think, not to be too uh, generalized, but I think most bureaucrats tend to be liberal. Even for a Democratic president, trying to get things through the bureaucracy is often, you know, pushing a string. Right. And the frustration of having to actually try to get things done um, was, was really a challenge. And you, but that's the thing, you actually have to deliver. You can't send a campaign, you just give a good speech, and they applaud, and, and you know, the dial meters go up, and you get votes. It's great. But that's just the beginning in, in the White House. And so it takes an, an enormous amount of, of discipline to continue to follow through and follow through. Um, and, and that, for me, was, was, is exciting. It was interesting. It was a real learning curve. And then also knowing that everything that happens 
you know, redounds to you, not to you personally, but to the president. Fred Barnes told me that when Clinton first became president. Fred said, there's only one question in Washington, and that is, how does it affect the president? Yeah. He said, there's a typhoon in the Philippines, and right. we will ask you, how does this affect the president? Right. And he was right, and I never forgot that. And I remember I got deeply involved in NASA. Yeah, I grew up not far from NASA in Houston, but the, the, the Russians had an old Soviet tin can called Mir. And as a you know, joint space exploration peace thing between Clinton and Yeltsin, we were sending astronauts up there. And I popped off at one point to Clinton. I said, you know, Mr. President, that thing, but it was always breaking down. I said, that thing blows up and one of our guys is in it. You know, that's your rear end. Mm -hmm. And he said, now it's yours. And so I had to dig deep into it. We actually chose a guy for the next one to go up uh, who had no spouse or children. Jeez. Had to talk to his mom. Met with all the astronauts. They said it was safe. They said, we're not cowboys. And they made the case to me, and ultimately the president, that the fact that everything was breaking on Mir was really a good thing. Because we had the space shuttle, it would land, and we would spend a million person hours fixing it in perfect gravity and perfect conditions. And what NASA was arguing is, actually being in an old Soviet-made hunk of junk is really good training for future space missions. And it was one of those things that I love because nothing happened, nothing went wrong. The astronaut went up there, he came home safely, thank God. Uh, the Russians were thrilled. You know, the State Department was weighing in. Madeleine Albright's like, we can't back out on the Russians. And so it was this huge thing. It, but it was all out of the papers because nothing bad nothing happened. Nothing happened, yeah. And I you know you saw that a thousand times. So you much actually do something is, good. You know, not <laughs> having something. You never get credit for the bad things that don't happen, though, or rarely do. I mean, right, so, yeah. right. I, I still wish I had a framed headline that said, American astronaut returns safely. Right. And Clinton as president, I mean, what was he like? You know, all these stories by now of him in the White House, losing his temper, not losing his temper, endless meetings, that always struck yeah. us overdone. But the first term, the first year, lots and lots of that. I mean, you're trying to get your arms around this huge behemoth and trying to pass a really huge economic plan, as these guys always do at the start of their terms. And I guess as governor, correct me if I'm wrong, I've always wondered about this, governor of a small state, he probably could run that. I mean, that's not personally, right? That's just like yes. you knew enough to just decide everything, basically. Yes. And he knew that state so well, and it was so small, and everybody knew everybody, and that was a And that's much. a bit of a trap, don't you think, when they come to Washington? Absolutely. I've always thought this thing about how governors are naturally good presidents. It's, not qu it's a little more complicated because you could argue that being governor, especially of a smaller state, is more unlike being president than like being president. Because the scale is so vast, and especially if you are smart and you have a lot of capacity, you don't like to sleep. You know, he had to learn. To, to delegate and, and, you know, he had a series of chiefs of staff and I think each had really great gifts. When John Podesta wound up being his last chief of staff and then advised President Obama, when John was the staff secretary, which is one of these jobs nobody knows about, yeah. it's incredibly powerful. Staff secretary is the person who provides the information flow to the President of the United States right. and then executes all the official documents. But nothing gets to him but through John. Right. And, you know, the President was so famously curious and he would he would say, well, I want to know more about that, or I want to know more about this, tell me more. And John was the one, in a way, almost helped to school him by saying, no, sir, that's not ready for you yet. It's not going to come to you right. until the interagency process is finished. Yeah, yeah. And he hated that at first. Clinton's like, well, I'm the president. I want to know. He's like, no, sir. And you need people like that who, right. who are professional and disciplined and will force delegation. Now, by the second term, he'd had Erskine Bowles, who was a businessman. He'd... He had Leon Panetta, who was really experienced Washington hand, and then at the end he had uh, he had John Podesta, and they all helped. It, it, I think you know if the impeachment had happened in his first term, I'm not I'm not entirely sure we would have survived. Because one of the mm -hmm. ways we survived was just simple management. Ninety five percent of the White House staff stayed in their lanes. The Domestic Policy Council kept doing domestic policy, the Economic Policy Council did that, the National Security Council did their thing, and in fact Podesta told people. At the senior staff meeting, he said, if I hear you talking about the impeachment stuff, I'm going to fire you. Wow. You have a job to do. And it was, so I was in the parallel universes. I went back and forth, but I worked mostly on impeachment. And what that told me was our strategy as well. It told people he's still working on the business of the government. He's not obsessing about his own problems. And, you know, we study this. Michael Waldman was President Clinton's chief speechwriter. Michael's I think good historian too and he went back and studied Watergate and found every day every statement Nixon kept talking about it and talking about it and talking right. about it plus we had a recession 
But so the voters got the sense that the president's only worried about his own survival. Right. Clinton took the opposite tack. John kept all the trains running. So we always had stuff to do. Here's a new proposal. Here's a new bill. Here's a new executive order. And his rhetoric then would, would was the opposite of Nixon. He would say, Sam Donaldson would ask him some latest question about Ken Starr. And he'd say, Sam, I know you've got a job to do. That's your job to answer that to ask that question. Here's my job. Let's make sure these children have access to good, affordable health care. And that's what I'm going to focus on. So you focus on what you want. And it, it was gold. It, it, it had the virtue of being true because of the management that, and discipline that the president and, and John brought to the place. But it also is, is exactly the kind of message that had sustained him in his campaigns when he had scandals. But then also it's what voters wanted to know. Uh, you wrote some of Clinton's biggest speeches, like the 92 convention speech, I remember. But I can't, I can't remember the 98 State of the Union speech, which was what, like a week after the Lewinsky scandal right. broke which was a pretty amazing performance and high, highly substantive and exemplified. I think it probably was the key moment where you launched, in a way, that strategy. Right. Were you, did you write that? I was, I was involved in it. Waldman was a chief speechwriter. He had a great staff. I was involved in it. Um, and there was a very brief, very brief debate, do we mention the Lewinsky scandal? And, of course, now it seems obvious. It was interesting because everybody in the press said, of course, he has to. Yeah, I remember that, yeah. And... Inside the White House, it was we brought it up and we brought it to him. We were in the family theater. It's like now this, you know, here's the speech. You'll notice there's nothing about the Lewinsky scandal. And he looked at us like we were crazy. Why would you put it in anyway? Uh -huh. And very, I don't remember anybody saying yes. It has to be in there because again, people knew about it, <laughs> but they didn't know about his policy ideas, and that was the strategy. And a year later, then he's giving his next State of the Union address during his impeachment trial. I guess that's right. I forgot that. And, of course, by then it was a foregone conclusion. You know, still, your presidency is on the line. But it was very evident that the folks who wanted to get rid of him were not going to muster 67 votes to expel the president from office. But it was, a, it was a very tense moment, especially for those senators in both parties. They took their jobs very, very seriously. They really did. I was impressed. And I was talking to the Democrats every day, many times a day. They were really serious about their role. So the president comes, and you, know, you take the limo over to the Capitol building, and they put you in um, one of the speaker's offices, this beautiful office the Speaker of the House has. And the president gets that alone just to chill. Of course, Clinton's still going over the speech and making changes. And so to distract him, just to kind of, you know, lighten the mood, I fought one last rear guard and failed attempt to have the president not call 2000 the beginning of the millennium. Because I'm a liberal arts major, but I can count. There was no year zero. Yeah, yeah, the so. millennium didn't actually begin until 2001. So right, I was kind right. of being a stickler. He thought that was crazy because it's like common, you know. Right. And, and, but I just did it really just to lighten the mood, just to give him something to, you know, just to spar with me about. And I was teasing him. I was like, you're going to go down to history as the first president. Couldn't count. And so we were like actually laughing and joshing. And the doors open and the Senate committee this, to escort him to the State of the Union just walks in. And it's Senator Biden and Senator Thurman and all the, you know, Senator Lott and like all the most senior members. And they've been all day trying this man to try to decide whether to remove him off. And they walk in and he and I are cracking up and laughing and joshing. And he literally then turned to them and put the question to them. Yeah, hey, there. guys, come here. Polly thinks we should call, we should not call 2000 the millennium. Don't you think we, and, and they, they couldn't answer. They were just, they yeah, were right. so freaked out by the fact that he was that loose. Was there any moment in 1998 when you thought, he could actually be forced from office? No. Is that right? You guys no. were pretty confident. Yes. It, it, you know, the, for me, the bigger question was would I resign? Yeah, well, I... And I almost did. Difficult. And I chose not to because of the impeachment in part. And I, I really did take it seriously that I, like you, I'd sworn an oath to the Constitution, not to any particular man. And I felt, I felt very deeply that the impeachment was unjust and unjustified. It wasn't warranted on the Constitution. I had an obligation then to stay. Um, and I'm, I'm glad I made that decision. I'm proud. I'm almost embarrassed it was so difficult. But there was, I never thought there was, you know, a real likelihood of that. The most difficult, it's, it's the only time I underestimated the American people, was Podesta called me in his office. He was chief of staff. He'd just come out of the situation room. We had uh, decided to go after Saddam Hussein, right. Operation Desert Fox. And what I later learned is uh, the Joint Chiefs were a little, like, sheepish about because of the impeachment stuff. And then Clinton said to them, just 
just do your job. What if there was no impeachment? What would you recommend? And they told him, well, we should have done it months ago. Actually, this is now the second or third violation. He'd been thwarting, mm -hmm. you know, we know the whole history of Saddam. And there were something like 500 known or suspected sites of weapons of mass destruction we went after. And John told me, that. Like, you need to start writing the statement. We're going to bomb Iraq. This is like the week before, this the week like, of impeachment. Right, I remember into this vividly. It was December. actually as the vote. I think they put off the vote day. Or I two. think they did. It was so December. This is December of '98. Yeah. So yeah. it was right that same week when everything else had happened. And John told me that, and that was the one moment I put my head in my hands. I said, I, I don't know if people can take this, and I knew it was, it was not wag the dog or whatever because right. I, I was quite sure we were ultimately going to win that. And all the polling, it wasn't just you know, like faith. The polling was that this was a disaster for the Republicans. So there was no. Obviously, and, and of course, the, we had a Republican Secretary of Defense actually thank it is because that right. protected us from the charge. That the, and those generals were never going to do that. And they were unanimous in their recommendation to strike. And Clinton said, well, I'll handle the politics, you know, and I'll, I'll fade the heat. And in the main, there were a few Republicans who complained, but in the main, the Republicans also said, well, yeah. we, have, we have to do this. And, but just for that one moment when John told me that, I thought, I don't know if the country can take this. And I'm proud to say the country totally got it. They, they could hold two thoughts in their heads. You know, big domestic fight here. But here's virtual unanimity that we had to knock this guy back. And at the end of the Clinton presidency, there was the Gore campaign. And uh, um, I can't remember, you, were you much involved? Little Very involved? tangentially. I, although I, I played George W. Bush in the debate well, press. That's right. That was my job for Al Gore. Did you do a good job? I think I did. I kicked his ass. I mean, <laughs> is that right? I, you know, I, I mean, Gore is so smart. But I watched all the tapes of Bush, and I do think, as he would say, they misunderestimated him. Uh, he, you know, Ann Richards had been my county commissioner. I'd known her forever and a day, and no more gifted politician had I ever seen. And he beat her. Not only and beat her in the election. She was the incumbent governor of Texas. She was incumbent governor of Texas. And he beat her in a debate. Yeah. It, so he was quite good. And I, I, I do think, you know, Team Gore might have uh, underestimated him a bit. And, you know, Bush did some really smart things, like on foreign policy. He didn't know much about it. He famously told some reporter he thought the Taliban was a rock and roll band. <sighs> but whenever, in, in the, there was only half of one debate. Can you imagine I that? I know, I was thinking, I know. That's and I think so. Jim Lehrer was the host, and he brought up various issues. And you could, at least I believed, when Bush kind of wasn't sure, he just hugged Clinton. Yeah. So Because why not have national unity on, on national security? It's not what the election was going to be about. And he's like, well, you know, I think the president's got Africa policy just right here. Yeah, right. And it was so smart in a way that, you know, that IQ doesn't measure. His, his emotional intelligence, enormously talented political strategist. Uh, and Gore, who has, I think, very high IQ, did not have the same uh, political sense. You know, it was really, uh, that actually was the most consequential election of my lifetime. Um, and, and I think... Obviously, Gore should have carried Arkansas and Tennessee and New Hampshire and Florida. I th frankly think if they'd used Bill Clinton more, they would have. And Gore people will say, well, we polled it, and he wasn't popular with the swing voters in the swing states. My answer was, yes, send him in. <laughs> he will be by the time he gets out of, out yeah. of the state. You know, we'll turn him loose. And the Clinton people were frustrated by the Gore campaign. Enormously, beyond And he personally was, without getting, oh, yeah. revealing any confidences. Oh, yeah. 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 Um, I mean, he wanted Gore to win, right? He thought he would be a good Desperately. Person. In fact, I think he might have helped Gore too much in the primaries by clearing the field. Really yeah. pressured Gephardt not to run and a lot of other really able Democrats. Now, Bradley ran. He was a pretty right. impressive guy. But Gore is the only person in my memory to have a, a serious opponent and run the table yeah. in every single primary who was not an incumbent president. And I think that's part of what bred the overconfidence yeah. going into to, to face Bush. Um, that's that's you you know that's finding that balance is difficult you want to be confident you look in the mirror and think i should have nuclear weapons you know you're probably not lacking in self-esteem but you don't want to be so overconfident that you you uh don't take your adversary seriously so we've been talking about the 1990s now it's 2015 what strikes you i mean about washington or american politics today is, is it the same similar different what, what, what are you most imp impressed by it's this is not, I get this question a lot, this is the most polarized we've ever been. And there's certain polling that shows President Obama the most polarizing president in history, followed by his predecessor, George W. Bush, followed by his predecessor, Bill Clinton. So we're in a moment of great polarization. Right. But obviously, this is nothing like Vietnam. 
this is nothing like the Civil War. Right. You know, Preston Brooks is not crowning, you know, Charles Sumner over the head with a cane like the 1850s. And in fact, the, you know, the president does have his haters, obviously. Every president does. This is what they're accusing him of, being a Kenyan Marxist socialist. Well, the truth is the world has got millions of Kenyans who are lovely and millions of <laughs> socialists and millions of Muslims. It, it, you know, they accuse Clinton of a lot worse, a lot worse. They right. accuse him of murder. Right. And so it's not. I mean, I think some of it is we all have to toughen up, the political actors. Um, this is, Go back and look at how Jefferson and Adams went at it. To far more... Far right. more savage than anything today. So I do think we all have to toughen up. I, I don't like the current climate. That's, I think, and I'm sorry to blame, but I think it's young people. They all grow up, you know, because they get these stupid participation trophies <laughs> for having been alive during their five-year-old soccer game. I hate that stuff. You know, you, you have to toughen up. The world does not exist to protect you from having your feelings hurt. Right. In fact, it's good to have your feelings hurt. Toughen up. You're an American. Yeah, you better not become a... You are teaching at Georgetown, but you better not say that at Georgetown. You could get in a lot of trouble. <laughs> no, you know? at Georgetown, I think, you know, the Jesuit tradition is pretty well, robust. That's true. They're, they're pretty tougher. Yeah. Tough guys. But but I think that, I think this is the difference, though, and it might flow, that we're not polarized as much, but we're paralyzed. We can't get anything done. We, we got a farm bill done, thank goodness. That used to be one of the easy things. We can't even get a highway bill done. Everybody drives. Everybody wants good roads. The, like the easy, obvious stuff... That, that always used to happen is not happening now. And that's what I don't understand. I, I don't. Um, I guess it's, you know, the way we gerrymander. Some of it is the media, you know, people like me, maybe like you, you know, spinning up my side and, and the other side. But I can't really put my finger on a why. But there's stuff in the worst of the, the you know, Clinton-Gingrich wars. Newt and President Clinton stepped up and doubled the funding for the National Institutes of Health and National Cancer Institute. That wasn't a lot of money. It was about $5 billion a year. Not, not, no, it was more than that. But it was about $19 billion a year. But it was a joint left-right thing. And, in fact, the Senate sponsor was Connie Mack, a cancer survivor, a senator from Florida, who ran against, who, who was opposed in his last election by Hillary's brother. Hmm. He didn't care. He wanted to help people with cancer. John Edward Porter was a congressman from Illinois, a Republican. He was the House sponsor. And, you know, we came together. That should be obvious. And I noticed this a couple weeks ago. The president announced a new initiative on cancer research. It's an issue I care about. Much, much smaller, really small, but okay, maybe we don't have as much money. And he announced it and there was no Republican standing with him. Either he didn't reach out to them or they rejected him. Either option is bad, right? That, that, that's something. I mean, cancer does not say, are you Republican or Democrat? Right. Even the stuff that used to be no brainers to, to work together with, we can't do. And that's what I don't understand. I think some of it is, is, is even voters. We keep firing people for the crime of compromise. You know, ask Richard Lugar, you know, senator from Indiana. Ask Blanche Lincoln, who was challenged in her primary in Arkansas, a Democrat, because she was too moderate. Yeah, how'd that work out? Right. right. So <laughs> what happened is we replaced a conservative Democrat with a conservative Republican. And then two years later, four years later, I guess, replaced the, the, a moderate Democrat with a conservative Republican right. and managed to destroy the Democratic Party in Arkansas. Yeah. Right. So I... I Bill Clinton state. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't... I, I guess when... If I were a rich person, if I were a donor, and these politicians came to me for money, I think what I would say is, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give you money. But about 10 to 20% of the time, I want you to piss me off. Yeah. And Because, you know, that's a sense that maybe you're kind of doing something right. Yeah. We can't only always play to our base because no one is in sole possession of truth. There's no chance. I mean, I'm a Democrat through and through, and I love my party. There's no chance the Democrats are right on everything. You know, you have to have cooperation with the other side. Do you think it's a temporary thing and it was, you know, Bush and the war and now Obama and the yeah. tough reelect and Republicans. Also, I think part of it, don't you think it's just Obama wins, he has a mandate. Republicans win in 2010, they have a mandate. Obama right. wins in 2012, he thinks, hey, I've got a mandate. 2014, Republicans yeah. win. And so it's a little maybe just peculiar to this moment. I mean, that's nice. The demographics are such that for the foreseeable future, midterm elections look very strong for Republicans. Presidential elections look very strong for Democrats because the varying turnout among the rising American electorate. So I, th I do think that's, that's a big part of it. I wonder, we talked earlier about the collapse of the Cold War, uh, the, the, the Soviet Union. You know, I think people of our age are still of a mindset that was actually an anomaly in American history. Right. You know, from Ike to Reagan and maybe Bush, our presidents could and 
in Kennedy's case, almost did destroy the world. And so you had to have a little extra reverence. If, if, I, if, you, if you take that out, I think the, the kind of hating on Obama or Bush or Clinton is very much in the right. long tradition of American history. But, but if, if you're a child of the Cold War, we couldn't afford to do that. You know, as much as, you know, Democrats opposed Reagan or Republicans opposed Lyndon Johnson, there was, a, I think, a bedrock level of trust and support that you had to have or you couldn't sleep at night. And so in a weird way, maybe that's a good thing. But I, I do want to see us get back to the regular order of just getting stuff done. I mean, we could at least, you know, pave roads and fight cancer. Right. Well, I think it, it'll happen one way or the other. These cycles, these are things are cyclical. You and I have been through this and have discussed this. Whatever everyone agrees that something is the case, Republicans have an electoral college lock. Democrats right. are demographically destined to win forever. Usually the opposite happens. So I assume now that everyone's so obsessed with gridlock and partisanship, maybe, you know, it'll break one way or the other. But Someone will, I think it'll take, it'll take a conscious effort. And then even on the House and the Senate, someone's going to have to lose their job for never compromising. Yeah, that's interesting. We've had, you know, when Clinton ran, he talked about the brain dead politics in both parties. He was sworn in for a second term, his hand on the Bible, the book of the prophet Isaiah, and thou shalt be called healer of the breach, right? And they impeached him. Bush, who I knew in Austin, great guy, got along so well with the Democrats and said that. I want to be a uniter, not a divider. Right. Even more divisive than Clinton. Obama's most famous speech, there's no red states, there's no blue states, there's no... so we've had three presidencies in a row three two-term presidencies in a row, yeah. where a central animating motive of these politicians was to unite the country, and yet we're more divided than ever. So some of it, what did, what did Shakespeare say? The fault near Brutus lies not in the stars, it lies in ourselves. Right. Some of it is us. We have to be better citizens. Right. What about, I mean, you'll obviously be supporting Secretary Clinton here, assuming she is the nominee, or assuming she runs, which I think most people think she will, in 2015, 2016. I'm curious, just analytically, so putting on your analyst hat since... Uh, Republicans aren't going to take your your guidance about who to vote for in primaries. What do you, what do you think? Do you think? I'm just curious. I mean, is Jeb Bush as much of a front runner as people think? What, what's your sort of analysis of the actual race? You know, it's not my party, so I'm often wrong. Although, actually, I've, I've never been wrong because they always nominate the oldest white guy in line. Right. It's a hierarchical party. It's a party that values experience. So if you've lost before, it's a good thing. I admire that actually. Democrats hate that. If you lose, well, you have yeah, to go yeah. to like. If you, you were know. a Republican, you would not admire, you. You would admire it to a point and think enough already. You <laughs> but know, you do I, learn. I finally thought after 20, 2008, maybe the Republicans would stop nominating the loser from the past time, and they sure enough they nominated Romney. And it's not always the best the way to get the best candidate. But if they do it this time, I guess the last man standing with Romney, I believe, was Rick Santorum. I know it's not so. Good. So let's assume it doesn't happen Rick, this go. time. Yeah, right. <laughs> so the, the, your party is so much more in a state of flux. Yeah, it's interesting. My party now is. The hierarchical seems very settled. It's never been that way. We always want the shiny new thing. And, and it's, so it's, it's so interesting analytically. It's going to be really fun right. to watch. But, you know, mostly the establishment candidate winds up winning. Right. And that certainly would favor Jeb. But this time the establishment lane is very crowded. It was not when Romney ran or George W. Bush. So not only do you have Jeb, you've got lots of others who can really plausibly claim that being much more establishment than, say, Tea Party or Christian conservative or libertarian. The, the three governors in the Midwest, who I think are really impressive, Scott Walker, John Kasich, Mike Pence, really impressive. Um, and with the exception of Pence, in blue states and having to govern successfully and campaign successfully in blue states, that always gets my attention. I would not count out Ted Cruz being a Texan, watching him win a landslide down there. He, you know, he has... Barack Obama's education in Sarah Palin's politics. <laughs> so nobody can say, oh, he's stupid. That's always no. such a cheap conceit from my side. Right. He's brilliant. And maybe the most conservative member of the United States Senate. Yeah. And I think the party may, re I'm serious. I, I, so I really have no idea. But th there's such a diversity yeah, I agree with on that. your side. Not just lots of candidates, but with lots of, I mean, Rand Paul, you know, on national security, Hillary Clinton is probably closer to the majority of Republicans than Rand Paul is. Yep. And Rand Paul even, he said he wants to end all foreign aid, even to Israel. Do you know how much damage that would do to the United States? You know, we don't, I mean, I know we're a noble country, but we don't do that just because we're good guys. We do mm -hmm. it because that's our national security. So it, it's, I can't wait to see it develop, but that, that's where all the action's going to be. On my side, you know, the press will try to pretend there's a fight. It would be better if Hillary had a fight. I'd rather she had a really tough 
primary challenge. I just don't see it coming. Yeah, I know the better. I mean, Obama, I remember 2008, being on TV Tuesday after Tuesday as Obama and Clinton slugged it out. And our friend Karl Rove would say, that's really damaging the Democrats. You know, and right. there's a poll, 32% of the Obama voters say they won't vote for Clinton. Remember this? And 32% right. of the Clinton voters say they won't vote for Obama. And I remember saying, I don't believe any of that. I mean, that's just like in the heat of the, right. of the fight. But they're all going to vote for the Democratic nominee. And I think this fight is helping the person who ends up winning. And I think it did end up certainly not hurting in 08. I it helped really Obama. Helped. And I think he would tell you that. Um, it, I think they toughened each other up and tested each other out. And he had to put, especially on foreign policy, he had to put his ideas through a pretty rigorous right. uh, uh, test. I think that could be good for the, for the Republicans, yeah. too. Instead of just taking as a given America's role in the world or what we ought to do about Social Security, I mean, almost everything is on the table with the diversity candidates you have. I mean, one friend of mine, at a point, I'm curious if you agree with this, that with Bush having such a huge fundraising advantage, you can't sort of run, it'll be hard to run just an orthodox, conventional campaign. Hey, I'm newer, younger, I'm a governor. But my ideas are basically the same as Bush. I think at that point, if you have 10 times as much money or five right. times as much money, you probably win. So I think it might encourage the sort of other Republican candidates to be a little more imaginative or inventive in their message, because just, just to be able to cut through against, uh, among themselves, first of all, to emerge as the alternative or a leading alternative, and then to have a chance against Bush. Absolutely. And the democratization of media has made money somewhat less important. If, if you're clever enough, you make an ad that catches on. Joni Ernst just got herself elected to the Senate from Iowa, first in a crowded primary field, and then, and then against the, the candidate the Democrats wanted. He turned out to not perform very well. But right. that's, she got everybody's attention for making Todd Harris, made the most creative ad of the cycle, where she talked about growing up on a farm and how she castrated hogs. Boy, that'll help her cut the pork in Washington. Brilliant. Funny. It caught on. I went and watched it on YouTube. You know, so those kind I think people who can live off the land who are creative, which I don't know that they can win, but that would favor, it seems to me, maybe Cruz, we haven't seen him, but Huckabee and Santorum have proven to be resourceful right. and creative and be able to go on a shoestring budget. Do you think the money situation has changed because of super PACs, too, that the sort of conventional fundraising is less important? If, I mean, Jeb Bush can get a zillion $2,600 checks to his campaign, but if one or two billionaires like someone else, they can fund super PACs that would keep someone else in the game? Or Yeah. Now, I, of course, advise the pro-Obama super PAC, which is now going to be a pro-Hillary super PAC. And so they're, they're the most important point. Yeah, right. Now, there's still, it's, it's still so much more important what a campaign does. Right. But there's a level at which um, if you can, if you're creative and you can, uh, the free press matters so much more than paid ads in a presidential campaign. Far, far more. Yeah, that's it's more credible. That's interesting. And people, people see it and they they believe it more. And then you can get into the free press with a clever video or a clever, you know, uh, particularly something that's funny. I, I, I think wit is way undervalued in politics. People are drawn to that. I'm not sure who the wittiest one is, although Huckabee is a very funny guy. Yeah, he um, is. He's got a great sense of humor. So, uh, yeah, I think the, 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 and then, so I guess that's what they have to do. They have to be creative, live off the land, be, be fearless. Don't be afraid to be an insurgent in a party that used to not like insurgents. But then find some billionaire, <laughs> some eccentric right. billionaire who will finance, you know, vicious attacks on, on Jeb Bush. That, that's kind of, I mean, I think Santorum had strong support from Foster Freeze, who's a very right. generous donor. And Sheldon Adelson, I know, helped Newt through an right. independent uh, super PAC. So there's, you know, you can find somebody. And Santorum almost beat Romney in Michigan and Ohio. People have really forgotten that. That was a yeah. close-run thing. He, yeah, and Romney outspent have. him probably 5, 10 to 1 by conventional metrics. You so. know, I've done two campaigns against Rick Santorum. He won one, and my client, Bob Casey, won one. So I have high regard for his talent. And what he has, the Republicans need, is sort of a blue-collar Republicanism. Right. He should have beaten Romney in those Midwestern primaries, even in Michigan. But he got dragged back into social issues, which even the Republican Party, they were like, this is too divisive. Remember, he got he asked about women in combat and Catholic, birth uh, control. John Kennedy's and, speech. And, uh, oh, that's right. It's, it's a Kennedy speech when Kennedy spoke to the Baptist ministers in Houston and said there should be a separation. He said that made me nauseous and sick to my stomach. And, you know, he, he keeps getting drawn back into those. If he had stayed on the kind of Republican version of blue collar populism, he would have beaten, you know, Romney, the, the private equity guy, in his home state. 
Yeah, it'll be interesting. I do wonder how many of the usual rules are, are out. I mean, as you, as you said, the, the parties are sort of flipped. The Democrats are nominating the next in line, the senior person. The Republicans seem to have a wide open race. But if you think about the, the change in the situation of money with super PACs, the schedule has been changed. Media has changed so much in the last 10, 15 years, obviously, the Internet. You sort of wonder how much the precedent, what happened in you know, recent campaigns will whether that'll happen again. Right. I think most exactly. people assume it will, donors and operatives, but well, I wonder the, if we're just... The one with the most money the year before the election begins always wins, except yeah. Obama beat Hillary. <laughs> and I think on the Republican side, McCain did not have the most money. Right. So in that race, they both were they wrong. Everyone's these sort of forgotten stupid that. stupid rules because yeah, yeah. the N is so small. We've had so well, few presidential... Insane. So the taller guy always wins. Okay, John Kerry is like a foot taller than George W. Bush. Right. How'd that work out for him? You know, we right. always have these stupid... Rules, when the truth is you got to put them on the track and let them run. Let me ask you one last question. Um, I'm just curious about this. Since, uh, were you always a liberal, basically a Democrat? I mean, uh, how'd that happen? It seemed like such a, bright, such a bright, pleasant <laughs> guy. I don't know. I need, we need to have an explanation of this. I you grew know? up in one of the most conservative places in America, Sugar Land, Texas, in the 1970s. And we're, ultimately, our congressman was Tom DeLay for many years. That's right. Who was like the liberal right. back home. <laughs> What is Sugar Land, a I, suburb I, of Dallas? It's now a suburb of Houston. It was Houston, a small I mean, town yeah, yeah. that was far from Houston, and, you know, the growth has come. We had a prison and a sugar mill, and that's about it. And now it's huge and beautiful and very nice, and, you know, I don't go there anymore. <laughs> <laughs> it's not where I grew up. But I don't know, I guess. I think I came of age politically in college at the University of Texas. Um, before that, I, you know, I, I cared about politics. I, I've always been and, and remain a faithful Catholic. And I, I think that that has always informed me. And, and as you know, Catholics very often, you know, there's a social gospel that, that moves you toward, I guess, what in America be economic liberalism. At the same time, there's a reverence for family and for marriage, and 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 that that doctrine of personal responsibility. Um, but my parents, you know, I guess my, my mother's, I think, liberal. And I think my father's probably moderate to conservative. Um, but they, they voted and they were informed, but they weren't very into it. They, were, they had lives to lead and children to raise and jobs to do. <coughs> um, the biggest thing, this is even in the 70s, though, was the, the prevalence of racism and race as an issue. Yeah. My parents are from New Jersey. I was born in New Jersey. They, they, they didn't have a prejudice bone in their body then or now. And that was absolutely verboten. And they weren't bad people, but everybody I grew up with said the N-word all the time. Is that right? All the time. And my parents were repulsed by that, and so I was repulsed by that. And I think maybe that was, that was the dominant issue. And it was, I was post-segregation. Our school was fully integrated. You know, it was the 70s. But, but th there was still such visceral racism, not by everybody. Everybody used the N-word, but often not even, you know, right. thinking about it, you know, in the way that people did back then. So... On that one, that was the biggest issue, and frankly, the big government was right, the feds were right, Lyndon Johnson was right, the Democrats were right, and maybe that had an effect, but it was really much more in college, you know, when I went to the University of Texas, which is this beautiful blue oasis of liberalism in, <laughs> in blood-red Texas. So we can blame the universities, that's good, but I, I was struck, <laughs> well, my wife's family, my wife's mother's family really is from the South, and I do think if it was, if you were, if you had decent attitudes and on race relations and were really concerned, uh, certainly a generation ahead of you, but even maybe as in the 70s, it, it probably pushed one to the liberal and democratic side. Uh, fairly or unfairly, you know, the Democrats, in fact, were running the South, of course, all those years when they were oh, segregation, right. but somehow that got, you know, that, that got well, lost. Well, they turned it. That's the thing. It, you know, tomorrow's not like today. Right. I, the, I was born in 1961. That Democrats were the party of segregation, of vicious racism. Even right. there were Democrats who opposed anti-lynching laws in Texas, right. opposed them, wanted to not criminalize lynching. Those were all Democrats. In my home county of Fort Bend County, Texas, there's a very famous Supreme Court case where once you know people began to enforce the laws which allowed African Americans to vote, the Democratic Party of Fort Bend County, Texas formed a private association called the Jaybird Club. And the only people who could vote for the Jaybird Club were white people. And then the Jaybird nominee was the only Democrat who was put on the ballot. And so it effectively disenfranchised black people. And the Supreme Court said, no, you can't do that either. So there's this long legacy of that. You're right, but the Democrats have completely flipped. And, you know, it, it shows you, you know, the capacity even for huge and old institutions to reinvent themselves.
It's a good note on which to end. So, Paul, thanks so much for joining me today, and thank you for joining us on Conversations.